Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Turn there with me. We're going to get there eventually. <clears throat> Justin, come up here real quick. I want Justin to come and uh, I'm just going to ask him. I, I saw something he said. Uh, I think there's about 60% of you that are walking the same journey that Justin's walking. Come on in here. So this is the perfect light right here. See? Okay, yeah, good. <laughs> Um, uh, and I saw him put something on Facebook the other day, and I thought, man, that was, that was really good. That was really good. And Justin, just share with us. Um, I know that FPU is affecting a lot of us different ways. And, um, uh, but for you, Facebook Day, would you share that just real quick? It's having. Um, when, when we started FPU, I didn't really know what it was about or anything yeah. much of. All I knew was it was going to save us money. <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> So, you know, going through the first two weeks, I just basically realized that uh, it's more about, it's becoming more about me and my wife being a team and being more about that instead of just about me and how stubborn I've been and everything like that. Okay. I love it. Did you catch that? It's about my wife and I being a team. And I know over the next few weeks, um, uh, Justin and Marissa and, and others, uh, couples, you guys are going to struggle. And there's going to be times um, where maybe I heard a couple say it last night. They want to put sumo suits on, you know, and just go after each other every once in a while. There's going to be times through FPU where you're going to feel like that. But keep going because this is part of the process. Part of the blessing of FPU is learning to work together, together as a couple. And uh, I know Dave Ramsey also talks about if you're single, finding an accountability partner, someone who can kind of help keep you accountable as well. But this is going to do something in our marriages. And so um, uh, Justin will be leading our marriage ministry after this. And, uh, no, give Justin a hand. Good stuff. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Good stuff. You know, over the past uh, few years, we've had a lot of... Uh, of companies in the United States and around the world that have gone under. Some of them, if I say the word Enron, what, what comes to your mind? I mean, you think of illegal activity and some things that maybe they did that was underhanded and, and was wrong, and I don't even understand it all, but I, I know this, they did something wrong. And they got in big trouble, all right? Um, and uh, and so, um, so you think about... Uh, who was there? Who, who was there that was making those decisions? Uh, who, who did the weight fall on? Who, what, what was their bookkeeper, their administrator? What were they thinking? I, I'm sure they call them like some big three-letter COO or something. I don't know. But what were they thinking? They, were they thinking they wouldn't get caught? Well, then there's other businesses even closer to home, like even in our own community, in our own area, over the past few years that have gone under. And it wasn't even so much because of they did something necessarily like illegal. It was just somebody just made some really bad decisions. The person who they had in charge of the numbers and, and uh, the money, they just weren't making good decisions. Now, uh, now, just think about it. Can you imagine a $2 million business, a business that saw $2 million, that's a small business, and going through $2 million, not having a budget? Not having somebody who takes time to look and see where every penny is going. And, every, and, and can you imagine a business that has around $2 million of business going through not doing something like that? Now, let's take this a little further. Because what you'll figure out, if you sit down and figure out from the time you got your first job to the time that you go to be with Jesus, they estimate the average American... There's going to be around $2 million that's going to flow through you. Everyone turn to your neighbor say, you're a millionaire. <laughs> okay, there's a lot of laughing going on right now. Me? A millionaire? No, you really think about it. From the time I had my first job, at the time my uncle was part owner of Lincoln Avenue Schwinn, and so I, my first job was in the basement of Lincoln Avenue Schwinn, putting kids' bicycles together. Now, I want to see what your response was. I appreciate that response. My wife laughed when I told her that once. Because um, I'm not, you know, it's not necessarily my greatest gift is working with my hands like that. But I, I could put a kid's bike together, and every once in a while they'd have to fix what I did. But overall, 
overall, I got paid fairly. You know, I got paid for the work I did. It was, uh, what, uh, minimum wage, maybe like five bucks an hour, whatever it was back then. And that was back, yeah, I worked next to Noah and, and Moses and others. And, um, but from the time I got my first paycheck from Lincoln Avenue, Schwinn, all the way to the time that I go to be with Jesus, it, understand, there's somewhere around $2 million. For some of you, it's going to be more. For some of you, maybe a little less. But for the majority of us in America, Two million dollars is going to flow through you. Now, as you begin to think about that and understand, um, uh, are we going to be answerable? I mean, when we stand before God, the Bible's very clear. That in fact, in, in a, eventually we'll get to 1 Corinthians and we'll talk about um, the judgment seat of Christ. Because we're all, you and I, all of us, we're going to stand before God someday. And it's not necessarily, if you're a follower of Christ, it's not going to be necessarily a judgment of whether you're saved or not. It's going to be a judgment of what did you do with what God blessed you with. You say, well, he had, it doesn't seem like he's blessed me with a whole lot because my checking account is zilch. zero. Well, you still have something. You still have something, even more than just money. What did you do with your gifts? We talk about it this way. Your time, your talent, and your treasure you're going to stand before God. I'm going to stand before God one day, and I'm going to be judged. Judgment seat of Christ is what it's called. And you, you begin to think about that, and if $2 million is going to flow through me, and I say flow through me because hopefully, you know, that's what money ought to do. It's, it's not just there just to stay with me. It's there to flow through me. Then oh, do you think there's something I ought to think about? Imagine if um, I've heard Dave Ramsey even say it this way. Imagine that you were a company, and it's called You Incorporated. You incorporated, and you were the, the, the financial manager for that company. Um, so, so the way you manage money for you, would you fire you? Or would you say, oh, no, I'm going to give you a raise. <laughs> Come on, be honest. If you were a company, and, and you think about your checkbook right now, think about QuickBooks, whatever money, whatever it is, software, or whatever it is you use, if, if, if you were your own company, the way that you handle your money, the way that you keep track, would you hire you or would you fire you? That's one of the things that I think can help us come to a place is if we, uh, of understanding what I believe God wants to say to us today in this financial momentum message is if we start processing ownership and management through Scripture. Now, Matt's already alluded a little bit to, to um, uh, thanks for stealing my thunder, Matt. <laughs> um, but to where my message is going today. Um, but can I just jump on something? Man, I was thinking about, uh, do you think the Broncos uh, are regretting, or excuse me, do you think the Colts are regretting letting go of Manning? I mean, at this point, I just think I, I will never understand that. I'm a Bears fan. I'm just telling you that right now. But I never understand the, what, the whole thought process behind getting rid of, okay, now let's move on. Um, if we take and understand the way that I handle money does reflect um, uh, the Lord's uh, hand on me and the direction. Let's, let's talk about this. Um, as, as we process, what we're talking about here is a question of ownership and management. And as we start processing, at the end of the day, no matter how much cash we have in the bank, uh, no matter how much you owe on student loans or uh, hopefully not, but on Visa, MasterCard, or Discover, we have to understand that we are the managers of someone else's money. Everything I have does not belong to me. At the end of the day, no matter how much cash we have, there's someone else that it belongs to. The truth is we do work for you, Incorporated, and you don't own the business. You know who does? God, right? God is the owner. God is the owner, and we are the managers. Fill that in, will you? Now, for some of you, you're like, man, I've been living like that for a long time. I understand I've got the revelation. Well, let's just make sure. I want to make sure that my checkbook lines up with my belief today, okay? In fact, if you tune out of the rest of this message and you, like, count the lights or, you know, <laughs> say, wonder, why is that crooked? Um, if you try to figure out whatever, whatever, not that it bothers me or anything, but if you try to figure out and count, like, what are those things on the wall? From here on out, it'll, you'll, it'll be worth you coming just for this moment right now. God is the owner. We are the managers. If you can just grasp that, get a revelation of that, and beyond that, start living it. That right there is the bottom line of this message right there. 
If you and I can grasp that God owns it all, this is really the only thought I want you to walk away with today. God owns it all. Can you say that out loud with me? God owns it all. One more time. God owns it all. Whether you follow Christ or not, let me tell you something. You might be uh, just seeking out. You're just like, I'm not qu- so sure about this whole church thing, this whole following Jesus thing. I don't quite know if I get this. I'm just tell you, for you as well. It doesn't matter whether you submit your life to Christ or not, according to Scripture, or not. The fact of the matter is, everything you have, everything all of us have, God owns it all. It's what the Bible says. Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's. Check this out. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. It's all God's. It's all God's. We go to Psalm chapter 50, verse 10. It says, For the every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And guess what? He owns the hills too. <laughs> he owns it all. It's all His. He owns it. We, we may not like hearing it. You may say, well, this isn't God's money in my wallet. It's my money. I worked for it. I earned it. I deserve it. Trust me. It's not the first time that anyone has said that. In fact, as we go to our passage of Scripture today in Deuteronomy, it's one of the first uh, few books in the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, if we go to verse 10, in fact, even before we get there, let me just give a little background. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses relates God's commands to the, uh, to the wandering nation of Israel. The Lord had brought them out of slavery. Remember, if you've ever seen The Prince of Egypt, we just watched it the other night. Um, uh, great movie, great flick. But um, if you've ever read the story, better yet, in Exodus, um, you know, God brought the children of Israel out of Exodus, out of slavery. Um, he was providing food for them every morning. This new thing they had never had before is called manna. What is it exactly? Manna. He was protecting and blessing them in battle. And he was ultimately leading them into the promised land. However, the nation continued to gripe and complain. And they're like, well, we didn't have it this bad in the old days. And they started saying all kinds of stuff, some that wasn't even true. And they got a little full of themselves. So in Deuteronomy chapter 8, in this passage, we see a warning that is just as true to us today as it was for the Israelites thousands of years ago. Look at verse 10. Let's just read through this. Verse 10. When you have eaten and are satisfied, here's what you need to do. Praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Let's read on. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, And when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Verse 15. He led you through the vast and dreadful desert, that thirsty and waterless land that is with its venomous, venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known, to humble and to test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirms His covenant, which He swore to your forefathers, as it is today. Verse 10. Verse 10. The the passage starts with an excellent piece of advice. When you're satisfied, when you've eaten, you're blessed, praise God. Take time to say, God, thank you. I'm content. I'm fulfilled. You know, we're used to thanking God before we eat of a meal, right? Hallelujah. We pray and say, Lord, I thank you for this food that you've prepared. Bless it for the nourishment of our bodies. And we say, amen. What about, like, what about, have you ever taken time the moment you got your paycheck? Or what about the first time it drops into your account? Maybe you get direct deposit. I do. The first time you go to that bank book or whatever, you go online, you say, oh, my my check's in. It's Monday. Okay. God, thank you. I think that might be a great habit for you and I to start. I mean, literally, you take one thing that you could take and apply right now. If I want to really believe in the bottom right-hand corner, God owns it all. 
If I really want to believe in Scripture and I want to try to realign my life to understand that God owns it all, then every time you get blessed with a paycheck or every time anybody, would you just stop, pause, and say, thank you, God. I acknowledge your blessing on this. I know that I worked. I know that I was up late, or I know that I did. I know, but God, ultimately, you're the one that provides. I praise you for it. In verses 11 through 14, we see how God, uh, or how we get into trouble. Many people find that it's easier to praise God when they're hungering and they're, uh, they're suffering, whatever. And then we get the blessing. God answers the prayer. All of a sudden, we have what we prayed for. Oh, hallelujah. And then all of a sudden, we're not as intense in our praise and our worship. You know what I'm saying? We get a little spoiled. Success lulls us into this false sense of, I can do this. I got this one. And that only leads us away from God. When things are going good, we get job promotions, raised incomes, obedient children, hallelujah. Good grades, hallelujah. It's easy to sit back and think, yeah, we deserve these things. And as we convince ourselves that our blessings are the result of only our own hard work, we so slowly begin to lose sight of the Lord. We slowly begin to um, forget that um, it was He who gave us the manna in the desert. You know what I'm saying? Listen, I know we have a lot of small business owners in this church, and we have a lot of uh, hard workers in this church. And let me just encourage you. Um, just remind yourself. You've worked your tail off to get where you're at. I understand that. But remind yourself. And, and, and try to surround yourself with people that, who will help remind you. It's, it's, not, it's not all because of you. You played a role, but it's God who provides the wealth. You know, you, jump, you can jump all the way down to verse 18, but remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability pr to produce wealth. The moment any person in this room begins to think it's all about me, hey, some of you, God is gifted. God's gifted you with the ability to, to sell an iceberg to... To someone in Alaska. I mean, I, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. Whatever it is. I mean, God, you could, you could sell you know, whatever it is. I mean, you, God's gifted you with that ability. God's gifted you with the ability to, to take something from nothing and just begin to build it. And all of a sudden, you got a great business or whatever. I mean, but let me just warn you. Just don't get prideful. And that's what we're talking about. Don't walk away from the fact, of scriptural fact, that God owns it all. If we keep our eyes on our own accomplishments then what happens is pride begins to set in, right? Our hearts become prideful. You know, Proverbs chapter 6 says, pride's one of the few things which the Bible says God, he just really doesn't like. Is that what it says? No, it says he hates, absolutely hates pride. There's no blessing for a prideful person. Oh, God's grace is, is big. And you may be able to continue on for a season, but I'm telling you, if pride stays in your heart, it will take you down. I'm going to preach hard at you. Let's deal with pride. And don't think that it won't try to get its ugly grasp on you. Because I deal with it. You deal with it. We all deal with pride on some level. But let's be a church that walks humbly and acknowledges, not just like a church uh, pathway, but individuals. You are the church. Let's be a church that's known. When someone bumps into somebody, I'm spitting all over the place today. Hallelujah. You getting that on tape? I think I'm going to come stand down here by Jason and Matt. <laughs> when somebody bumps into someone from Pathway, they're going to say, you know what, something about those people at that church. They're, just, they're, they're gifted, but they're just so humble. There's a humility about them. There's, a, there's just, I, I like having people from Pathway at my workplace. I like hiring people from Pathway because there's just a simple humility about them. Ah, think about that. Proverbs chapter 15, or excuse me, um, verses 15 through 16 of this passage, it, they're really driving home the point that God is the one who has done the work. Speaking to the Israelites, Moses recounts all of God's miracles throughout their journey, and the overriding theme in these two verses is just this. God did it. God owns it. It's God's thing. Whatever it is you think you've accomplished, think again. God did it. You begin to think, my power, my strength is all in me, and I have produced this wealth. Hey, look what I did. I worked hard. I made this money. And, um, uh, and, and, and then you just bring yourself right back to verse 18. But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms His covenant, which He, which he swore to your forefathers 
as it is today. It's interesting at the opening of this passage, in verse 11, be careful that you do not forget. Don't forget. Don't forget. What are we not supposed to forget? The Lord your God. Failing to observe His commands, His laws, His decrees. Listen, it was God who blessed you. Let's be careful not to forget. And then at the very end, remember, verse 18, but remember, for, don't forget, remember, don't forget, remember. Seems like um, remembering is more an, an intentional thing. I do this, it's active. It indicates like a, a, a controlled, disciplined mind. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not just going to forget, I'm going to remember. I have to take time to go back and, re oh yeah, I'm reliving that. I should have done that. I'm sorry, I forgot. Happens quite often with me. I, I can forget something accidentally, but I have to focus to remember. I think this is one way in which Scripture is calling us to master our thoughts on this. But remember, let's train ourselves to not just don't forget, but let's remember every time a blessing comes, let's remember where that really came from. You know, you've heard me say this before, but your paycheck may be signed by someone from earth, but ultimately God is the one who provides. And some of you, you've walked through that. I've shared testimonies with you before, but if, if you can be, there's times when I, 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 just being honest, there's times when this, this thought that God owns it all has been really strong in my heart, and there's times when I've stunk at it, because <laughs> I thought, I am the supply, <laughs> I am the one. I remember when, uh, when we were in between ministry opportunities here, we resigned in Angola, Indiana, where we were for almost four years. And um, didn't have any idea where the next step was. They had given us several months of severance, and that was coming up. And, and God had already started processing us through the idea of starting a church in Middlebury, ended up being Pathway. But we hadn't made any final decisions. And, and I just remember just hitting the wall and just saying, okay, God, listen, this is going to have to be you. We still have a house. And, you know, as of the end of May, we don't have any income. So how are we going to? And it was just so miraculous. I could bring my journal. I'm so glad I journaled to that time. I don't journal all the time, but I'm so glad I did it that time because we can look back. And I think I've told you this before, but I, I'm not lying when I say my severance was up at the end of May of 2000. In June and July, if you add up every gift that was just out of every direction possible, people blessed us. We actually made more money in June and July than we did before when we were pastors. Yeah. And I, I'll tell you what God taught me through that. He owns it all. He's the supply. Can I just encourage you today? You may be walking through a situation. I was talking with some of you guys about college. And we're looking at college and how expensive it is. And all that. I was like, oh. I know my oldest is a freshman in high school. And I'm thinking about college. And, and it's good to see some of you college kids home. But hey, here's the deal. I was like, how can we afford this? Whatever. Let's just remember Let's make a commitment as a church, as people. Let's be vision-driven, not money-driven. Let's pray, and let's do what God lays on our heart, and let's step out. Let's be good stewards of our money. But let's just remember, my supply does not start with the treasure of Pathway Assembly of God signing my check. You know what I'm saying? My supply doesn't start there. I appreciate this church gives me remuneration and pays me. And gives me a check every week. I appreciate that. But ultimately, Pathway Assembly God is not my supply. Almighty God is. You see, the moment you start thinking you're the supply. Ooh, this is good. you got to get this. The moment you start thinking it's all about you. Is, is, is the moment that pride begins to set in. And God can't bless pride. But if you and I can come to a point. I'm not saying there's, nothing, there's anything wrong with hard work. I'm not saying that at all. And I'm not saying that there's um, anything wrong with wanting to better yourself or do something. No, no, no. Just remember, as hard as you work, just still remember, God owns it all. He is our supply. I can forget something. I said. Think about this. God owns it all. That doesn't just mean that God owns all the land and all the stuff. It means this. Check this out on the screen. It means that God gives us our abilities. He owns those. He gave those to us. God gives us our resources. He gives us our skills and our talents. He gives us our opportunities to earn money. He gives us bodies and buff bodies like mine and strength and energy to work and, and, and beautiful hairstyles like mine. Our employers, he gives them the money to pay us. So just be real careful. The curses you throw out at your boss, 
I'm not saying anyone here, maybe the person sitting next to you needs to hear this. <clears throat> Be real careful the way you talk about the owner of the business and the way you talk about your boss. I understand sometimes people make decisions that are dumb and you might have made it differently, whatever. But listen, you're not in that position. Learn to honor those over you and understand it. Um, God's the one that gives them the money to pay you anyhow. You want to call curses down on them by you? They're just a blah, 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 blah. Not that anyone would use any blankety blanks, but I mean, just, just be very careful how you speak about those that are, that are over you. Okay, uh, uh, he gives us our homes, our jobs, our families, our business partners, our ideas, our creativity, dedication, ingenuity, and initiative. God gives us that stuff. God owns it all. It's all his. And so here's what I want you to get out of this. He gives it to us to manage. It's all his. He says, Scott, here's, here's some money that you need. To, here's some kids. Listen, my kids, I have three beautiful daughters, but listen, they're, I'm, as I know they're Megan and I, but here's the deal. They're ultimately, they're God's, and I'm a steward of them. And one day I'm going to have to answer to God about how I help train them up to follow Jesus. And, 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 and I understand all three of those girls have to make their own decision. What a blessing it was last week to baptize my middle child. And I love baptizing my own kids. I love baptizing your kids too, but something special and it's your own, you know. I mean, that's awesome. They're following in the footsteps and following Christ. But all of them are going to have to make that decision for themselves. My job while they're in my house is to do everything I can to live the life and point them to Jesus. But I got to understand this. I'm just a steward. I, I'm just a manager of that thing. Those kids, my stuff. And so when you start thinking about that, you just, you just think about, um, w just kind of start walking through that. Here's the scoop. Simply recognizing God's ownership isn't enough. We still have to be good managers. We've got to manage well. Remember, the ultimate goal isn't just for you and I to gain financial momentum just for ourselves. It's for them as well. It's to be a blessing to others. We sang it this morning in our songs, you know. And my life be lifted high. God, let a song of Jesus and the hope fill this community. And, and I know as we sang that song, let us resound with singing. Some of you are like, so you just get visions in your head of just frolicking through the streets and singing songs about Jesus. And no, 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 that's not really what we're, oh, we're just talking like take the, the hope and the joy of Jesus and the hope we have, let's make sure it doesn't stay here. Let's take it with us. Take it outside. The hope we have in God, the hope we have in the promises of Scripture, we got to take that hope outside. It's about blessing others. And, and, and this is, fill this in your notes, bad managers can't give. A bad manager doesn't take the owner's money seriously. He doesn't value it. He squanders it and steals it and just spends it however. If we aren't faithfully managing the owner's money, it won't be there when he tells us to give something away. Let's just think in terms of business again. What would happen in a workplace, you incorporated or whatever job you work at, if the boss asked the bookkeeper to cut a check, but the bookkeeper couldn't because he had spent all the owner's money? Hey, could you cut a check for this and that, whatever? And the bookkeeper's like, um, you know what, I'd be glad to do that, but... Uh, slight issue here I'm taking this cruise to Bahamas my wife and I and we've already paid for it so there's no money for you to say bad management there's a person that's gonna lose their job right you got to get a revelation of this we are made to be givers you and I are made God so loved the world that he gave his only son died on the cross for us it's it's just the whole nature of God he's a giver and if we're going to follow Christ, we want to live like Christ, we've got to learn that we've got to be givers. Now, you know, I'm, I, I, that's not just to the local church, though the lion's share of Megan and I's finances flow in through the local church, but just everywhere you go, just be a giver. Be something. You, you reap what you sow. Just be a giver. It doesn't matter how, mon, uh, how much money you have. Let's just understand that if we're going to manage God's money well, we've got to learn to be givers sometimes we get confused about who owns something and and something sad happens isn't it strange when some people become more successful they also become more greedy moody and anxious i mean yeah. sometimes you, the, the the more stuff you get 
the more you cling on to it. The more, I, I've seen people like that. I've even seen it in my own life at times. You know, you have the old cruddy lawnmower that, you know, half the time you got to kick in order to get started, or at least it makes you feel better. <laughs> Hope the neighbors didn't see you because they know you're the pastor. <coughs> Not that I'd ever do that, but, um, yeah, and you did just a lump, you're pushing the lawnmower, and then you get the, <clears throat> the John Deere riding lawnmower, and, you know, and, and, and you, you're a little more careful with that, and, you know, the junkie lawnmower, your neighbor's lawnmower breaks, hey, you want to borrow my lawnmower? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, just, you can have that one. Then you get the John Deere, you're thinking twice, <laughs> it's like, did you pick up your dog poop yet? Because I don't want that in my tires. And, you know, you're thinking through, uh, I'm sure none of you think that, but you get blessed with something, all of a sudden you get a little more stingy. Let me just remind you, God's blessing comes on me, comes on you, so that not so that we can be Velcro, right? And it sticks to us. We walk around with all the blessing. Aren't I blessed? This, I'm just so blessed. No, God's blessing comes so that we can be a mirror. And then when that blessing comes, we can just reflect it back on others. Listen, there's nothing wrong with having a nice this, fill in the blank, nice car, nice house, nice, nothing wrong. But uh, there's nothing wrong with having stuff. The, the problem is when stuff has you. You've heard me say that before. But let's just be real careful that we understand. Let's make sure stuff doesn't, we are managing our stuff for God. And God desires you to be a generous giver. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion or because somebody stood in front of you and said, you better give or else. Um, uh, you know, I've been in some church services where I just want to get up and walk out because the guy was so fortunate. If you don't give today, people are going to die and they're going to blah, blah, blah. And I understand completely we need to give. But listen, don't guilt me into giving because the Bible says I ought to give cheerfully. I'll give cheerfully. Just sit down and be quiet. <clears throat> Because I've got no joy in the way you're, you're helping encourage me to give. We give cheerfully. Not just in church, but outside. We give. We bless others. How, we cannot be joyful givers if we have the wrong view about money. A spirit of giving doesn't happen in a vacuum. Giving in and of itself is not really a decision we make. Giving is a natural response to the right view of money. You want financial momentum in your life. And my prayer is you do. Some people are like, ah, I don't. They, they look at anyone that has any kind of a blessing on them and financially and whatever, and they're jealous of them. They look at someone who has a financial blessing or whatever, and they, and, and, and just, they get jealous. And they go, well, they, you know what? My prayer is, is that every single one of you are blessed in such a way that you can just turn around and bless others, bless others, bless others, bless others. You see, when, when you start thinking through kingdom mindset, the kingdom of God, through the scripture, when you start looking at life through scripture, when you start living out scripture, when you start looking at finances through scripture, you begin to see that, that, that there's nothing wrong with wealth. Wealth is not sinful. Um, uh, God wants to bless. He wants to give... He wants to bless, and the, and the more he can see that when blessing comes to you, you turn around and bless others, what we see is many times that's when more blessing comes. And so I just, I, I want you to get, let's make sure in our minds we've nailed this down. This really, this, this, this table is not mine. <laughs> you know, this, this shirt's not mine, it's God's. If God would want me to take this and give it to Matt, I'd do it. You know? That's just, this shoe right here, Partially worn, it's not mine. It's, Matt, you need a shoe? You doing good? Okay. Um, it's not mine. If, if we can learn and understand and grasp this, God owns it all. The confusion comes when, when all we're doing is just working for ourselves. Um, if that's our focus, we're thinking about ourselves. The confusion starts to set in. Let's turn that confusion into faith. Say, God, everything I have is yours. So today... I want to end with this question, so what? Yeah, that's what I've been saying for the past half hour, Scott. So what? So what? So what if God's the owner? What if we're just the managers? What if everything we have belongs to God? What if he expects us to go and do and to give when he calls us? So what? What does any of us have, what does any of this have to do with your life 
right here today. Look at this last question on the PowerPoint. Since God owns it all, what needs to change about your budget, about your buying, about giving? I told you about 20 minutes ago. You could have left. Thanks for not leaving. But God owns it all. That's just, that's the main thought. If we can get a revelation today of the fact that God owns it all. Everything I have all belongs to God. And so if we understand that, if we get a revelation of that, what's, how's that going to affect my budget? How's that going to affect the way I buy stuff, the way I give? If God owns it all. There's a lot of uh, different ways we can ask the same question. Um, but as we, as we kind of conclude here today, I, I want you to think, so what? What do I need to do differently? Look at this last scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. Just a reminder. Remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability pr- to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. It is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. It's him. You know what I believe? I wish I had my, uh, <laughs> I wish I had my computer bag in here. The bottom of my computer bag. Yeah, I'm a geek. I have a computer bag. Um, the bottom of my bag. I, it was maybe I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. I don't remember, but it's one of the first times I ever went to this place called the Animal Kingdom in Orlando, Florida. I walked through that park. And it's a Disney park. And I walk through there, and I, I got a drink, and I notice there wasn't a straw to be found in the whole place. You could not find a straw in the whole park. And I thought it was interesting. I'm not a big straw guy. Maybe you are. I'm not big, but my kids, um, especially at that, uh, my kid at that point, and, and so we had two children at that point, I remember. And, um, uh, and my wife, she likes herself a straw. So I'm looking for something. There's no straws in the whole park. I thought it was strange. Then I found out they have so many animals in that park. They're afraid that if the plastic straws get into the cage or whatever where the animals are, that the animals are going to choke, they're going to die, they're going to lose a lot of money. So they just say, no straws. I thought, well, okay, seems like a little, little overboard, but that's all right. Next time we went back there, they had straws. I thought, what? They have straws? What are you talking about? And I looked, and they're actually, they're a specially made straw. They're, they're not plastic either more papery. Uh, it's like, like a more of a papery type straw. And you can still use it, but I don't think you could reuse it. Why in the world are you talking about straws? <laughs> I'm getting somewhere with this. Stay with me. And I just started thinking there, and I, I started, but I, I, somebody saw the idea, saw, saw this, and thought, hey, we don't want to, the, the poor little animals, we don't want them dying on us. Don't go dying on us, you know. And so, so we don't want those animals dying on us. So here's the deal. We're not going to have any straws. But somebody pushed through. Somebody said, we, we can do something about it. There's got to be something we can do. And someone either searched it out or someone either created a, a paper straw that would work for that park. And do you know, since that day, about 10 years ago, since that day, I have prayed for you. And I have prayed that there would be paper straw makers in this place. I have prayed that God would give you dreams and God would give you ideas as novel as that idea. I prayed it over myself as well. Nothing's really come yet, but <clears throat> but I'm as serious as a heart attack because, listen, God, God is not done in our country. He's not done in our world. There are people still who have yet to hear the name of Jesus and God wants to fund us sending the gospel around the world and my prayer is that every single one of you would God give would God just give you all kinds of ideas and and all kinds of thoughts and as as you come upon that straw idea as you come upon whatever that idea remember this it's God who gave you that wisdom it's God who gave you that direction and you begin to build that business build that idea whatever that is You begin to just be that entrepreneur that God put in your heart to be, but you use that wealth, not just so that you can have more stuff, but so that you could be a mirror. God owns it all anyhow. You take that blessing, and you reflect it back to his kingdom. I'm telling you, some of you right now, even as I say that, your heart's coming alive. There's some of you right now, you're, you're, you're pushing back on me. I can feel it. You're saying, it could never happen to me, but I'm saying, we've got a big God. 
We've got a big God. Do not limit God. Just let God give you a dream today. I, 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 I'm, I'm not trying to sound like a motivational speaker. I'm trying to sound like a preacher, but I'm telling you, it's because I so believe in the Word of God. He's, he's in the resurrection business. He's able to resurrect whatever your dream that's fallen asleep. Oh, I pray preachers and apostles and prophets and evangelists and, I, and, and missionaries, and I pray they come out of this church. But you know what I also pray? I pray business leaders. I pray teachers and professors who are going to teach others. I pray, I pray all kinds of people that would be in the marketplace and, if you will, in the full-time ministry out of this church that understand this. God's the one who gives me anything. All wealth comes from Him. God owns it all. Can I pray over you right now? Let's pray. Worship team, would you come? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the straws of life. God, I thank you that you speak to us through your word. And today, as we're reminded out of the story and the, the fact, the history, out of the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8, we're reminded that all wealth comes from you. In fact, I think it's in James, it says, every good and perfect gift comes from above. And God, I just ask right now that you would just begin just to give us a revelation in this place. Because there's people in this church that we limit you. Because we think the only place God's provision will come is through a check signed by my boss. And God, I just pray today, would you just give us a revelation that you own it all. You own it all. Stretch our faith. Expand the borders, if you will, of our faith to, to see that you are an unlimited God. You're able to do all, even beyond what I could even imagine. And we thank you for that. Stretch our faith today, God. And on the other side, there's some of us, every one of us at times, we deal with this is my stuff. This is mine. I worked my tail off so that I could have fill in the blank. I could have this house, this car, this lawnmower, this John Deere. Whatever it is, I work my tail off so that we could afford that. It's mine. God, just remind us today, give us a revelation that ultimately it's not mine. All, it's all yours. God, you not only own the, the cattle on that hill, but you own the hill as well. God, just give us a revelation of that today. Build our faith to trust you, Lord. We need your help today. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Can you just keep your eyes closed just for a second? I'm just going to ask real quick. I, I just respond, no one looking around right now, just between you and God and me. You say, Scott, would you pray for me today? Because I really struggle with the fact that God owns it all. I really struggle with this one. And you just, you're just you sitting there feeling, I've got to respond somehow, some way. <laughs> no, we're not going to take an offering. Just relax. <laughs> but <laughs> but you're, you're here today. You're just like, man, I really struggle with the thought that God owns it all. Because I, so, I take that responsibility on myself. And I need to just release this to God, even if it's just, uh, just a raised hand. Or whatever. I, right now, I've got to signify that, God, I mean business. I'm declaring right now over every part of my life, my children, uh, my future, my future children, um, uh, my, my marriage, my job, my career. I just have, I have to get this off my chest. God, you own it all. If that's you right now, would you just shoot your hand straight up in the air right now? You just, I, need, I need special grace today to ask God to do that. Right now, come on, just shoot your hand up. Okay, thank you, thank you. Hands up all over right now. I want to pray a special prayer for you right now. Come on, receive this by faith. Heavenly Father, God, I'm not just asking you, but I'm just declaring right now. Church, would you pray with me? I'm just declaring right now. Something is breaking in every person's heart that just lifted their hands, in their emotions, in their way they think. God, um, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So, God, there's even going to be stuff that's in their heart. It's changing right now. They're going to talk differently now because of what you're doing in their heart right now. God, I just pray a fresh revelation even before they leave this place. There's going to be a peace 
and a rest about their children. There's going to be a peace and a rest about their finances, about their job situation, whatever it is. They're struggling just to say, it's not about me. I, God, there is pride right now that is crumbling in people's lives. Right now, as they go to work tomorrow, there's going to be a significant change. People are going to notice it even on their countenance because there's, there's a rest about them. There's a, a humility about them. God, I just pray, and I pray this prayer. Whatever it takes, bring us to humility. I pray that. For me, for everyone in this church, I, whatever it takes, we don't want pride to get in the way of you accomplishing your will in our lives. God, we've been talking about financial momentum, just seeing a, b a blessing rise up in us. And God, we're lining up our things. We're being good stewards of our finances. We're talking about that in FPU. But now we want to deal with some heart issues. A heart issue of pride is gone now in Jesus' name. I pray you'd uproot it out of our heart right now. That root of pride right now is being uprooted and it's, it's we resist the devil. We rebuke that. Lord Jesus, I pray every demonic stronghold that's trying to build pride in the hearts of people in this room right now in the name of Jesus, uproot that thing right now as we yield to you. Your word says submit to God, resist the devil and he must flee. God, we submit to you and to your word. It is through you that I can accomplish all things. And God, right now, I just we submit to you. We resist the devil. Command him to flee right now. And let that ugly pride just run right along with him in Jesus' name. God, we receive right now by faith. We receive. We receive peace. We receive it right now. We rest in you. And the revelation that you own it all. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name. Everyone just keep your eyes closed just one more time. We're going to close in a second, I promise. But I just got to ask, are you struggling in your walk with Jesus? Where are you at today? Where are you at? Are you running from God? Have you really submitted and surrendered your life to Christ? If you haven't done that, just real quick right now, I want to pray for you. Just slip your hands straight up in your ear and say, I need prayer. I need prayer. Thank you. Someone else, I just pray. I need to solidify my walk with Jesus. You see, every one of us was born sinful. The only way we can deal with that sin in our life is through Jesus Christ. I don't want this service to end without you having the opportunity to come to know Jesus. Anyone else today? Raise your hand. Thank you for that hand. If you need to get right with God, let me just lead you right now in a prayer. Right now, right where you sit, just say, God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I am sorry. Seriously, right now, just between you and God, just say, God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I am so sorry that I have sinned, and I thank you that you died on the cross and you rose again. Come on, just believe right now. Just say, God, I believe what the Bible says. Even if you don't understand it all, just express that to God. Say, God, I believe that what the Bible says, that Jesus died for my sins, and he rose again, and he's alive. The Father um, caused Jesus to come alive again. I confess my sins. Right now, just between you and God, just say, God, I'm sorry for this one, this one, this one. Whatever it is, just everything you can remember. God, I'm sorry I confess my sins. And I thank you that right now that you're forgiving me, God. I thank you right now. There's someone, you're watching the video right now. You're watching this on YouTube. And this goes for you as well. Listen, don't, don't go another day without somehow turning your life over to Christ. Stop messing around. Don't run from God anymore. Don't run from God anymore. This may be your last chance to get right with God. I plead with you. I plead with you. Get on your knees right now. Just surrender your life. You're here in this congregation. You're praying. I confess my sins. I commit my life to following Christ the rest of my life. The rest of my life, I will follow Christ. No turning back. From this point on, I'm, I'm following Jesus, what he desires for my life. So God, I just ask that right now. Would you just solidify that? I pray every person that prayed that prayer for the first time, or maybe they were coming back to you today, I pray you'd baptize them in the Holy Spirit, empower them to serve you, to, to live out their faith. Holy Spirit, just do something fresh in every one of us, Lord. 
Thank you for what you're doing. Hallelujah.